Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. Got a great night ahead. Um, my name is Susan Knight. I work at UW Trout Lake Station up the road apiece. Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea, the idea that the borders of the university are the borders of the state. And at Science on Tap, you're not going to get a lecture, but we're going to get a a uh, nice introduction on a very interesting topic and then open it up for you guys to ask your own questions. I want to remind you about, oh, did I lose my microphone? I'm good? Okay, sorry. Sounded funny. Um, uh, anyway, I want to remind you of our partners. We, uh, UW Trout Lake Station, um, University of Wisconsin-Madison, Kemp Natural Resources Station, the Monaco Public Library, the Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and of course our partners here, our hosts, uh, the Monaco Brewing Company. So thanks to everyone who makes this possible. Also a special thanks to the Brittingham Fund, which uh, helps fund our uh, enterprise here. And a reminder that there are four ways to watch. You can watch right here, as you guys all are, or over at the library, the Monaco Public Library. And we have live streaming for anybody with a fast enough connection at your own home. And we also archive all of our programs um, so that you can watch them in the future. And also we, make, we, we archive the entire program and we also create a 8 to 10 minute short version of the program. So if you just want to get a little taste of it, um, those are available as well. Our next Science on Tap event will be April 3rd and our speaker will be Patrick Goggin. He's going to be talking about shoreland plantings. Um, and healthy lakes. So how to uh, resuscitate your shoreline if it's just kind of dirt and gravel down to the shore. He's going to tell you what to do. Uh, tonight we have Bruce Bacon. Bruce grew up in Clearwater Lake, population 100. And then he went on to a much larger metropolis of three lakes uh, for school. Clear, uh, Clearwater Lake ceased to exist as a town. Lake's still there, though. I've been on it a couple times. Clearwater Lake ceased to exist as a town when the post office closed in, 19, in the 1980s. Um, and that's uh, small town Wisconsin for you. Uh, his dad ran a potato farm, and with his five brothers, Bruce was outside hunting, fishing all the time. And uh, he was always attracted to birds, and in fact, um, to both wild and domesticated birds. And by the time he was 14, he w had his own flock of 100 laying hens, which kept him busy and earned some spending money. So Bruce graduated from UW-Stevens Point with a bachelor's degree in wildlife management and biology and a minor in environmental law enforcement. He worked for over 34 years with the Wisconsin DNR in wildlife management and wildlife research. Bruce's research began in southeastern Wisconsin, followed by time at the Mead Wildlife Area and waterfowl research in St. Croix and Polk counties. Um, the last 20 years, Bruce spent in the Mercer area concentrating on raptors, such as osprey. Uh, Bruce is going to tell us what he knows about osprey, including the specifics of the Iron County Osprey Project. Okay, and here is your trivia question for Bruce. After all his time out hunting, fishing, and chasing raptors, he has only one serious scar. Which critter caused it? A... This is a multiple choice. I want to be fair. A, swan. B, pileated woodpecker. Or C, a chickadee. I'll let him tell the story. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, um, it, I've been bit by bobcats and all kinds of things and never left a scar except a swan. And uh, they are really big, 40 pounds, and it actually dug a toenail in and ripped out some flesh and stuff, and it took six months to heal. But um, this nice big bird of peace <laughs> <laughs> left me with my only scar I got. So, well, thanks for coming. Um, we'll uh, keep this as short as we can. Um, it's only 68 pages long, covering ospreys from 1980 to current, so we'll be done by midnight. Um, Basically, I'm going to give you a, a brief overview, and then um, hopefully your questions will direct what you're interested in, and uh, we'll cover some more stuff. But this is a success story, a good feeling story. Ospreys are doing good worldwide. 
They're circumpolar in the northern hemisphere, um, migratory. There are a few populations of non-migratory in the southern hemisphere. But um, ospreys are basically doing good as a species um, after being the canary in the coal mine, uh, along with some other raptors when DDT and other pesticides were developed right after the uh, Second World War. And, and um, as I was looking at some of the DDT stuff, it's just incredible how fast we as humans must have accepted that untested uh, technology and spread that chemical because it was uh, a very widespread decline in birds that were had adverse effects to by uh, this pesticide, and um, so um, it's a good uh, story. Ospreys and other birds have recovered, but I think it's still something that we need to look at for the future and just because something's doing good, not ignore it. Just keep paying attention because if all of a sudden it's not going good, then why? You know, we got to look at stuff. So, um, so things are going good with Osprey. I'll, uh, let's see. Um, we'll pass these charts around, but basically you don't need to see them from here, but um, Osprey and eagles, their populations since the 70s have been going uphill. And uh, the um, uh, eagles have gone uphill faster than, the, or ospreys started out faster, but the eagles have kept going up and the ospreys have somewhat leveled off. We'll talk about some reasons for that, but you folks can just look at those. Um, in Wisconsin, we... Uh, have one of the longest running surveys of wildlife in that we fly eagles and ospreys in the spring uh, activity flight and productivity fight, flight, two flights for each species, but they're not done every year. And now that um, uh, ospreys are uh, recovered, which they are, that flight, I've been told they might do an um, activity flight once every three years now. The eagle flight is still being done. But um, in, ninth, in the Osprey uh, recovery plan, the goal was 300 nesting pairs or territories in the state, and we met that about 1989. And in 2016 was the last Osprey flight, which recorded 558 Osprey nests um, occupied territories. So this is, you know, basically double, and it's a minimum count. You know, there are Ospreys out there nesting that we don't know about, um, and that's a good thing. Now, the eagles, they're at, um, in 2018, 1,695 active nests, which is um, over three times as many as there are osprey. And again, um, both species were adversely affected by uh, DDT and, you know, pesticides. And Wisconsin was the first, one of the first states to ban them in 69 and nationwide 72, and so the populations have been increasing. Ospreys increased faster, it appeared, than eagles, but the eagles have overtook them. Um, so one of the th things is, for osprey, the, um, there's, um, right here, several survival factors. One is food, and they require fish. Um, eagles, will, they're... Um, They'll feed and scavenge on anything, like you all know. Ospreys, they need fish, and they need it in a habitat where they can catch them. So um, clear water with an abundance of fish that are in the shallows, that's ideal. And places where uh, there is enough food, osprey are actually colonial nesters, like on the East Coast, Chesapeake Bay and such, and down in Florida and stuff, and it's all food-based. If there's enough food, they'll tolerate other ospreys, and it'll be like colonial nesting. In Iron County, where we've done this study now, um, we have a lot of stained water and, and dark water, and that may be an impact. And then if you have fish, you know, the fish managers, the public wants walleyes. You know, they want muskies, and they want uh, other fish that aren't necessarily the fish taken by um, ospreys. So the, um, <coughs> excuse me, So food can be a limiting factor, but it's, it's generally not something that will prevent osprey from being in an area. Another limiting factor is nest sites. 
And probably historically, osprey relied on beaver ponds with their dead trees that they create when they flood uh, wooded areas and the snags. An osprey has to nest on the tallest uh, item, you know, tree, telephone pole, you know, utility pole, whatever it is. They want to be the top on top around uh, whatever's around them. If you've got a big open marsh and there's a uh, duck blind that's five feet high, they will nest on that duck blind. They don't need to be 10 feet or 40 feet. They just need to be the highest. So um, beaver ponds probably were their, their primary um, nest site originally. Now, um, when the osprey started to recover, uh, some fellows decided that well, maybe we could help them out by putting out uh, artificial nest platforms. And this has been done for quite a while. In, uh, on the turtle sample flowage, there were uh, some students um, led by Mark Pittman that actually put some nests out on their own design, on their own, just on a weekend when they weren't in college, came up and, and uh, they put a few platforms on the turtle sample flowage. And then later on, um, Ron Eckstein out of Rhinelander, who happens to be here with his technician, Fred Johnson, they started putting up some platforms in Oneida and Vilas County, and Jeff uh, Wilson and John Olson out of the Mercer Ranger Station, where I worked, I wasn't working there then, they, got, they started afterwards. So um, that, that group, with help, they uh, started putting up these platforms. And um, unique to some other areas, they would climb a tree, cut the top of the tree off, and it had to be a conifer. If it was a deciduous tree, the tree would die. But they cut the top off and put a platform on top. And many other places, there'd been platforms on the East Coast probably for 50 years. Um, but they'd be putting them on a telephone pole or a tripod or something like that. So these guys were some of the first to really top a lot of trees. And uh, it was hard work, dangerous work. You had to climb up to the top. And I used to carry around a full-size Osprey platform that was 30 inches by 30 inches. Um, <laughs> And so last week, I decided to make my own. And <laughs> so you can imagine, but this is the tree. And basically, to cut the tree off, you put a platform. And again, um, the first ones were just regular dimension lumber. We later went to treated lumber, so they lasted longer. But they are, are, are also a lot heavier. And you got to cross, and you got some wire. And if you put sticks in there, give that osprey an idea that that's a spot. And then there's usually three braces, so they, they stay up there. So this is what an osprey platform looked like. Um, so that took care of the nest site. Uh, predators and competition, initially that wasn't an issue. Um, but as the eagle population increased, there tended to be some, um, some competition there. So part of what we've done is trying to see, can we prove that ospreys are the actual limiting factor of ospreys where they have declined a little bit or stopped you know, expanding. And um, we haven't got a black and white um, answer to that. Um, another limiting factor was shooting. And um, in Iron County, we have banded over 500, about 530 uh, nestling osprey. And before that, um, the um, Don Fallon and his crew, they had done about 500, and they are the ones that taught, um, Don taught me how to band raptors, <coughs> and he came up to Mercer, and, and Jeff Wilson and John Olson started banding their birds in 84 under the guise of Don. So there's 500 and 500, and about 70 of those birds overlap. So about 900, maybe 950 birds, and the returns are kind of interesting. The early returns before the 70s, birds were being shot in the United States as they were migrating south. And some were killed in, in uh, Central and South America. But if they were, um, band reporting wasn't very good back then down in, the, in the tropics. So then um, we had laws that protected migratory birds and, and things like that. So then the shooting did stop in the United States, although about three years ago we had one of our birds, uh, or maybe even longer than that, and it wasn't one of our birds, but a Wisconsin bird that was shot in Ohio. So it still happens, but it's quite rare. Um, in Central America, it still happens, South America, but it's shifted. They all, every country has laws protecting them, but there's really not any enforcement. So um, it's, it was being shoo uh, shooting for sports. 
Now it's kind of turned to fish farmers, which we're promoting. Um, there's tons of Peace Corps people down there teaching these folks how to f raise fish and make a livelihood and stuff. And now the shooting of the ospreys is to protect their um, fish farms. One of the uh, things is that when ospreys go south as a, a juvenile, they don't necessarily come back until two or three years later. So the first-year birds are down there without that protection for anywhere from you know, 18 months to uh, you know, 30 months, something longer at any rate. Um, I'm going to read you one story really quick. When we've gotten band returns from Central and South America, usually it's a police officer, a clergy, or some uh, government official because they know English more so than maybe the peasant or the and, uh, farmer. And the other thing is there are some hunters, and I think to be a hunter in some of these countries, you're probably well-to-do. So um, here's a letter that uh, a fellow that was out hunting, and he shot an osprey. Dear sirs, and this was to the Fish and Wildlife Service because that's the, the uh, deal that's on the band. It is a pleasure to address you to inform you about your eagle that came to our country and which I was fortunate to find during one of my hunting days. On Saturday, December 7th, I went hunting to one of the valleys of the cooperative Guando in the Hural District, Hural Province, Lima Department, country of Peru. Being 6 p.m. while hunting, I observed that high on a tree there was a bird of great size and I was astonished to see it. So I got close, prepared my gun, and took two shots falling the bird to the ground. When lifting the eagle, I noticed that it was bearing a band on its leg with your address requesting to notify when found. I was amazed with its beautiful plumage and even more because it was coming from the United States. I had it embalmed and now I have it at home as my own trophy. I would like to apologize to you for the action committed on my part, but at the same time, it gives me great pleasure. Also, please answer my letter and inform me about the age and the date of the eagle was released to fly hopefully to have been excused for the happening and awaiting a reply to the letter, I remain attentively James Gonzalez de Goler, member of the Peruvian Federation of Hunting, Fishing, and Shooting, ID number 0779. Um, and the, uh, this was in 1985. Uh, I'm not sure if Peru had laws at that time protecting Osprey or not, but I've gotten... This, this letter didn't come to me, it came to the Fish and Wildlife Service, but I've gotten two letters back uh, were, were very similar. Apologize for shooting, but very proud and displaying it. Um, so that's where some of our bands, uh, band returns come. And it's kind of interesting, it's just a different life down there. Some of the bands, one band on the report to the banding lab, it was a missionary. And, um, oh, we wrote, one of the things... Um, trying to decide what I got to get done in 20 minutes. Um, when I came to Mercer in 93, I took over the Banning uh, Osprey project there at that time, which John Olson, Jeff Wilson, again, I, they had started it. And they were using these little tiny uh, color bands, um, which I looked at and thought, man, if I'm an Osprey, I'm ripping that sucker off. I don't like it. So we changed to these uh, heavier, thicker, this is the same material that you'd find on a goose neck collar or a swan neck collar, and it's laminated plastic. You can engrave through the outer cover and it exposes the inner, and that gives you the color. And, of course, they all have a metal Fish and Wildlife Service band that is actually crimped on. So of all the returns we got from Central America of the early banded birds, they just reported the metal. So I had the interns um, write letters and <coughs> try and get a response back. And one letter was from a missionary and said that um, she read the band after seeing the band on a dried up foot that the person was wearing as a necklace. <laughs> and uh, of course the colored band would have been on the other leg and there was no mention or no, the color band wasn't there. So um, of all the ones that we've tracked down that had a colored band, a small one, when it was recovered, um, no one could tell us it still had a, a colored band. So... With that knowledge, we've got about 220 colored bands, um, real good colored bands. And you guys can take a look at these, and you can look at how sturdy the metal bands are and stuff. Um, so out of that 220-some, um, and these are all nestlings, 
If we did catch an adult osprey, which is rare, we'd put a yellow one on. The uh, nestings all got blue. We've only had three come back and, and be part of the breeding population on, in Iron County. Um, at one time, the majority of the birds were from the turtle family flowage, but then the eagles moved in, and now most of our osprey in Iron County are in smaller lakes uh, away from, from eagles. Um, one of the th things that we found, um, I'll try and get done with the banding real quick and then talk about a food study thing. 25% um, of the fledglings that leave the nest are male. The other 75% are female. Female chicks are bigger. There is some evidence that the first egg hatched is going to be a female. So she's bigger. She's two days older than the next chick and four days older than the next chick. Um, so the, um, the females are in our study area where we have a lower success rate in, in fledging chicks are most likely three quarters uh, of the time females. So that leaves out of that 220 some, you know, it, it basically leaves um, 53 male chicks that left with a color band and we've had three of them come back. The males tend to come back to their natal area as breeders three, four, five years down the road. The females, they go with, other, wh with whatever boyfriend they hook up with in the tropics. <laughs> and we've had some of our females end up in New York, Ontario, and a number of them in Minnesota now as breeders. So, you know, uh, Iron County is putting osprey out there uh, as part of the big population. But as far as who's nesting, you know, back in their home territory, we aren't getting a lot of recruitment. Um, for that reason, we actually did a camera study. And as the biologist up there, I'd always try and find extra money. Um, and like from the Wisconsin Society of Ornithology or the Natural Resource Foundation, place like that. And every four years, I'd have an intern and they'd work just on osprey. And so I, I uh, had a camera study where we had um, six cameras but four recorders, so we'd move them around. And um, we'd leave them on a nest until the nest failed, and then we'd move, or fledged, and then we'd move them to another uh, nest. And um, this technology was such that back then it was VHS tapes that this stuff was on. Um, the recorders were huge, and uh, it would take, we could program them to take one picture per second. But then you'd have to look at the whole tape, you know, and kind of like a cartoonish until uh, um, a prey delivery would come and you could identify it. And um, so that was where I probably learned more about the individual lives of an osprey than and ever before. And now there are nests out there that have cams on them, you know, like uh, nest cams. So you can look at ospreys and learn about their daily life now. Um, I don't, there's probably a half dozen around the nation. But what we found was that um, our uh, prey delivery rate, so that's the number of times that the male who did 90 some percent of the feeding, the number of times he'd bring food back was kind of normal to what we found in the literature. Not a lot of information out there, but it was normal. And, uh, but what we found was as the chicks got older, the prey actually got smaller. The, um, <clears throat> when the chicks were um, large, their greatest nutrition need is when they're growing flight feathers, when they're growing the wing feathers and the tail feathers, and they're still growing in body weight and stuff. So that's when they really, really need a lot of nutrients. And all of a sudden, instead of these 17, 18 inch northerns, they're bringing these four inch bluegills. And the prey delivery rate was just fine, but the, the amount of prey being brought in was not that good. And so what I did was, um, and, and we had um, the interns, and I did some of the tape stuff too. We had them try and estimate the size of the prey too. And then I tried converting that to grams and such. And I mean, it, w it was obvious but it actually numerically came out that um, as these chicks got bigger, they were actually getting uh, less nutrients every day. A um, couple things that we found with the uh, cameras. Um, first of all, I thought ospreys, they're pretty cool critters, and they must be good parents. Eh, <laughs> not the best. Um, if it's raining, the female will cover the chicks. If it's cold, she'll brood them. Uh, but when it comes time to feed, the male brings in a fish, and she starts tearing it apart. When the chicks get older, sometimes the male will too, but initially it's just the female. And she just sits there and tears it, and if the chick doesn't come and get it, it doesn't get fed. And so the biggest, the strongest, pretty much got fed first before the next one and then the next one. 
um, unless she's tearing it apart quick enough. But by the time they were five, six days old from this camera, we could tell which ones were going to die as runts. Not right away, but we learned that. It was, it was pretty obvious. Um, and there were other times that, um, you know, the adults just kind of were standoffish, but they did protect, oh, and they would shade them if it was sunny. The female would sit there for hours shading these chicks. So she would protect them from the weather, but then they were kind of on their own. Um, and that's just the way it was. We learned that. Uh, and then the other thing is, um, I mentioned these flights that the uh, DNR had done and still does to, to, main, or to monitor the population. And, um, and I've been in the plane, and Ron has done much, much more. He could tell you more about this, but ospreys can be hard to see. Now, they nest on the top of the highest thing, and they're sitting in this structure on top of the nest material, but they're really camouflaged. And they're hard to see, and so the, the plane could undercount. And that's what we actually found was that the survey was probably undercounting chicks. But the alternative was that um, we documented chicks dying after the flight. And when we did our bird banding, um, we always we went after the plane flew so that we knew which nests had chicks. That, um, the climbers, and, and I've on, I only climbed a few trees, but um, they really don't like climbing a tree and getting up there and there's no nestlings <laughs> to band. It's just not a good thing. And, and we learned if there isn't an adult squawking and complaining, you shouldn't be climbing it because there's nothing up there. Um, well, the same with the plane. That's how we, we knew where to go. Um, but the other thing was, so um, the, the survey undercounted some because we'd get up there and there'd be three chicks and the, the flight said two but we had mortality after the flight. And um, we had the mortality after we banded them too, which we really thought those are birds that are gonna fledge. And it's probably because of this food, uh, lack of food right at the end of when they're still in the nest. And, and maybe that evened out. Um, typically the production, and this is any bird survey, is, is at banding age, when you band the chicks, you just consider them they're gonna fledge. And, and that's the productivity of the, that nest or that population. And we did, as expected, there was a little bit more uh, mortality after that. Um, see, there's lots of stuff, uh, I think what. Oh, the food items. Um, it was, if you want to know when you should be out there fishing crappies, watch an osprey nest. When they're bringing nothing but crappies, they're on the crappie beds. You want to be out there fishing them. And it was the same with bluegills and when the perch were in the shallows and northerns. And that also was the, um, uh, the different species that they were catching. Uh, it was basically when the fish are in the shallows. That, that was a key. And the few fish that were taken like during the whole uh, brood period was uh, like northerns. And I don't know if that much enough about northerns to know if they, they stay in the shallows all the time, or they're in the shallows because there's prey. But that was the one fish that was consistent for the whole period. Um, perch were pretty common. Bass were the least common based on what their, their availability. And um, walleyes weren't very common either. But there was no fish immune. There were muskies, not real big ones, but there were muskies brought up to these osprey nests. And one trout, which really had us stumped. And uh, it's like, where did this, like a 20 inch brown? come from. And then it was like, okay, this lake's here and roadwise about five miles to this fish farm, but across it was less than a half mile. <laughs> so we figured out where the, the um, brown trout came from. And uh, some in the audience would know Harry Manel. It was one of his fish, we assume, but um, he liked birds, so that wasn't a big deal. But we never told him. Um, so let's see, from the camera study, um, I guess, you know, like I say, we learned a lot about the individual birds' behavior when they're nesting and stuff. Um, we, our goal eventually was, are the eagles the issue um, in certain areas? And it was hard to prove because you've got the camera focused on the nest. It's a food habitat study. And you don't know if the birds are being harassed, and that's why the, um, the male hasn't brought a... a prey item in a while. And our, our interns and, and folks working on these, you know, when you're around a nest, of course, you're paying attention. And if an eagle did 
if ospreys could see an eagle from their nest, the male took off after it and went out of sight quite frequently. So um, part of it is just the male osprey not having enough time to keep feeding or keep hunting because he's off chasing eagles. And um, there is some direct competition, we think, especially with younger eagles that aren't good at getting their own food, that they harass the ospreys more and steal food. Um, and there's been a little bit of direct predation, but not much uh, as far as eagles uh, actually killing nestling ospreys. Um, let's see, what else? I don't know if it's time for you guys to throw out some questions. Um, well, one of the reasons, one last thing is that um, on our flowages, they were convenient spots to put up lots of osprey platforms. And these ospreys took to them right away. So there was a floater population out there that um, was looking for a place to nest. So that tells you that maybe those nests that the beaver ponds and stuff had provided were in decline. So they took to the osprey platforms really quick and they kept using them. And it was just a convenient spot to circle these you know, uh, flowages, put up lots of platforms. And um, the platforms, the wood, even the untreated wood could last 30 years. We did have some fall apart. The treated ones will last forever. The average natural nest was about three years. So, you know, that really worked good. But eventually, the eagles, which took longer to recover, they liked the flowages too. And the big pines and stuff along the shoreline, so that's where they would nest. And so now you had the osprey nest and the hunting area in the territory of an eagle that's also nesting. So now it's 24-7 harassment. Instead of nesting off on the beaver pond and only being harassed while you're trying to sneak in and get dinner and then get back to mom and the kids. So we did that through our management. And in many of these flowages, the osprey now moved off. And in some places, we know where they moved to. Uh, like in the case of the rainbow and stuff, they went to these utility poles and stuff. In Iron County, when the ospreys left the turtle flambeau flowage, um, about three years ago was the first time we didn't have any osprey produced on there. And at one time we had 22 nests. We peaked at 22 nests of osprey. And th th at that time there was three eagle nests. But anyways, um, we don't know where they went. We have one nest on a um, utility line now, and that's one of the few nests we've ever had there. So what we've been doing for our management is trying to move any new osprey platforms do not go within like a half mile of an eagle nest. We, and then if we're just putting them out blind, we put them on little lakes that are out, removed from the big lakes that attract the uh, eagles. So that's kind of what we're doing to maybe alleviate that little issue. Our ospreys here, do they mostly go to one place down south? Good question. Um, where do the e our osprey go? And um, they migrate separately. The males, they're done with their housekeeping first, so they take off. Um, the juveniles, they kind of take off next, and they go on their own that first trip south. They're just doing their own thing. And the females go last because they got to build up the reserves and get energy and stuff and then fly. So they go totally separate. They don't leave as a family. And um, our osprey go down to the uh, Caribbean, the, the Texas, or well, I don't know when they turn west, but they follow Texas through Central America and then go to South America and spread out. And our band returns, which I've got uh, like 50 of them up here that we've gotten over the years, um, ours and Don Pollen, um, a lot of them are from Panama, and those are early like December as they're migrating through. And then you get into January and February, and it's from uh, uh, Colombia, Peru, um, quite a, uh, we've got three or four from Brazil, uh, any of the northern uh, South American countries. And um, there is a couple, there's one from the uh, Antilles. I'm not sure where that is exactly. Caribbean. But there is some that do have crossed the Caribbean. And the eastern population of Osprey, some of those do cross the Caribbean. But ours mostly get to the coast and go around and through Central America. And then they stay down there for a year or two um, before they come back. But there are non-migratory osprey in Florida that stay in Florida. And there's some that stay the west coast. There's some that stay as far north as Baja, California. But ours go, the majority of ours go to South America if they can make it. 
So you said that they, um, they kind of do their pair bonding down in South America, Central America, and they bring back their, the males come back to their, there's kind of follow patching in the males, they come back to their, their birth, their natal area. Um, so the, all that pair bonding is happening down in South America, Central America, or does it happen here too? Do they go and find a mate when they get back? It's not an absolute. <laughs> I guess that's the best way, but um, when, um, when they arrive back here, they're already paired up. Um, I think the males tend to show up a little bit earlier, but they're, um, I'm not sure exactly when they pair up, like the start, because they do, one of the things is um, more of our males show up, I think in Peru, and more of the females show up in Colombia. So when they're on the wintering grounds, there actually is some sexual seg segregation. Um, so when they mix it up, I don't know if it's when they're coming back, they likely um, don't spend um, their time in South America paired up. Because even after they're up here and they mate and stuff and become up, they'll come back. Um, they don't mate for life necessarily, but it, they do show some tendencies of that. Uh, but they still migrate separately and they end up in separate countries for the whole winter. That's pretty common. So exactly when they decide, let's give it a shot again this year, I don't know. But it happens down south somewhere. Are they, are they occupying the same nest year after year, or they don't go m come back for a year or two? Okay, the adults come back every year once they get to the breeding age and the breeding stage, and they come back to the same uh, territory mostly. Um, the juveniles, when they come back, the males come back closer to where they were hatched and fledged, and the females are less likely to do that because they supposedly are following their new male back to his territory. And some of the thoughts on this is that the males are smaller, their survival takes better habitat. So the um, female wants to mate with some guy who came from the good side of the tracks, where she's got a better chance of raising her own young, and um, the males that are from poorer habitat, they don't survive. So they're not bringing back uh, any uh, girls. Well, they just didn't survive. So um, there's less recruitment to poorer habitat than there is to better habitat. I guess that's the best way to say it. Um, but once they're on a territory, um, with these color marked birds, we've had females uh, switch lakes you know, nest on the same lake for three, four years, and then we find them on a different lake for the next four or five. And when they move, it's kind of like a permanent move. Um, and whether or not she has a different male, because we had, I don't think we had any pairs where both adults were color marked. Usually it was just the female, uh, the ones that we had color marked birds. And so um, we did document mm -hmm. movements. And there is some documentation of uh, one male having two different nests with you know, two girlfriends at the same time. Uh, so there's some mixing it up a little bit, too. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the physics involved in their foraging? The what? What's the physics involved in their foraging when they're flying through the sky and bouncing into our lakes? Um, well, they, uh, ospreys, um, you know, they, they're sight feeders. So, you know, when they're... Uh, foraging, you know, and, and looking, they're hunting, and they'll hunt from a perch or from from gliding, and, and they can hover. They're one of the few birds that can hover a little bit, um, and they're, they're obviously very efficient at it. Their eyesight's unbelievable. The uh, thing that does affect them is if there's choppy water or stained water, or if it's a late spring, it does show that there's lower productivity. Uh, if there's spring storms, lots of rain, the more rain there is in the spring, that can lower productivity. But um, they, um, uh, you know, some people say they can see fish that are 18 inches deep. You know, I'm sure it's based on the fish and the water quality and stuff, or, or clarity, uh, things like that. Um, but it's the male that does most of the, the, the fishing. I don't know if that answers the question. How, how fast is he going when they hit the water? Oh, they're going can real you fast. Can you that? <laughs> how, okay, how fast are they going when they hit the water? I don't know. Um, but, you know, they... They'll be totally submerged, and that's a pretty big bird with a lot of buoyancy to go underwater. Uh, typically, they don't. Typically, if you see pictures of them and that, they just go and they rake a fish off the surface. 
I think that's much more common than them actually dive or going feet head first into the water and under the water. But they can be um, on the water with a big fish that has a hard time. The biggest fish, and this is an estimate that we had an osprey bringing to a nest. We figured it was like a 24-inch northern. And it was and it's taking a picture every second, so it's kind of... But it was powering up, and it got as soon as it got to like the front of the fish on the nest, it grabbed the nest with the other talon and just worked it, you know, because that was pretty impressive. Um, so, th but that's probably about the max that they could they could carry. And we did have a fair number of 20-inch fish that they brought. I, I have two questions for you. Uh, well, how uh, how uh, old will an eagle or will an osprey get to be? And I know they don't like eagles, or eagles don't like them. How much do they dislike each other? Will they kill each other? Okay. Um, the, um, I don't think it's been documented where you know eagles have killed an adult osprey. Uh, there has been a couple instances where I read about them t killing a nestling for um, um, to eat, I guess, or whatever. But the ospreys, like I say, if they have a nest, and an eagle comes along. That male, if he's around, he'll chase the eagle out of sight. They don't like each other. Um, if it's a female there by herself, she'll get up and chase away, but she won't leave the nest site. She stays pretty darn close. Um, and then your first question? Oh, age, right. Um, with our banding um, and the color marking, we did recapture a couple birds that had would been banded as chicks by Sergei Pavlov. Asfahali from Michigan. Um, he's passed away a, a couple years ago. Um, so we knew when they were hatched, and when they were 18 years old, they disappeared. And we had several of those, and we had maybe one of our own, too, that we knew how old it was. And then, you know, a 20-year-old osprey would be ancient, um, but a 10-year-old, the few adults that we caught, they kept coming back, you know, 10, 12 years old, old easily, and then we just lost track of them. We couldn't confirm that they had died, but um, I think an 18-year-old osprey is pretty old. I was lucky enough to come bicycling around our lake, and I saw an osprey with a fish. It looked like a pretty good-sized fish. I, no good on measurements, but anyway. It was good size, and he was trying to take off with the fish, and he, he was having trouble. Finally, he got off, and there was an eagle came in, and turned upside down, grabbed the fish from the osprey, and went down to the ground and, and started eating eating the fish. And I didn't pay attention. All of a sudden, I saw the osprey way up in the sky. The eagle finally took off with what part of the fish he could take, got up to, oh, it was way above my head, and the osprey came spiraling down and body slammed the eagle oh, wow. to the ground. And... and then he came down and took the fish because the eagle was out, almost out cold, sort of stirring in the bush, and flew off with the fish. And I called John Bates, our local okay. naturalist, and told him all about, wow, he said, you were lucky. Yeah, if you had gotten that on film, you could sell that to National Geographic. <laughs> <laughs> um, they do get the, we actually had a nest built by eagles on a, uh, fire tower, Springstead Fire Tower, and when the nesting season started, people were telling me there was osprey nesting there. And I'd watched eagles build a nest, and I thought, eh, okay, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Ospreys fledged too young off of that nest. So once in a while, they do win. So I have another question, a couple of other questions related to genetics. Um, where does the osprey fall in the evolutionary kind of tree of raptors? And has any genetic studies been done in Wisconsin or even elsewhere in North America to look at the, you know, since the, po the population was so low, how diverse the genetics are here, you know, in Wisconsin? So I don't know if there's, I, I vaguely remember reading something about the osprey being placed somewhere differently now in the genetic tree. I don't know if you have an update. Um, all I know is they're in their, they're, um, in their own family. They are unique, uh, Pandy and uh, they. As far as genetic studies, I'm not aware of any. Um, and I, I know on the hackbirds, they have taken uh, some blood to sex them, you know, as part of that, you know, s different places have done that. But beyond that, um, I don't know of any genetic stuff.
We have a question online. Yeah. Um, if the um, ospreys like fish so much, why don't you put the, their nests, their platforms closer to the water? Hey, th we did. We put them right over water. We put poles in water so there was not any, so to protect them from predators. Um, and it does work really well if there aren't eagles. The eagles came on their own. But yeah, there's, um, on the willow flowage, there's, uh, the bulk of the platforms are on telephone poles just stuck in a pile of rocks and stuff. And uh, they had pretty good success, but now there's a few more eagles around. Um, I went there and banded uh, ospreys about three years ago for the fellow that monitors them. And um, they were they doing okay, um, but the poles are starting to fall over and stuff. It takes annual maintenance no matter how you do it. Um, but yeah, putting platforms on water is perfect. It, it keeps raccoons away and things like that. It's just if there are eagles in the neighborhood, that's the, the issue. So. Another question? Way back. Oops, sorry. Question back here? Someone? Okay. You mentioned that the, the, they are recovering well, since the 70s, I've been told, correct me if I'm wrong, or what I heard was wrong, they're recovering mostly because of the artificial platforms. Would they be able to make this recovery without help? Um, the artificial platforms sped up the recovery. If DDT was still on the landscape, you could have every last artificial platform out there and it wouldn't do no good. Um, you know, if there wasn't a food base out there, it wouldn't do any good. So the platforms were a definite success story, uh, a management tool that actually worked and worked and helped the recovery um, and will help now by if we choose to put platforms um, away from where eagles are nesting. A lot of these small lakes and stuff don't have eagles. And so if we can move the osprey, pat, plat, or the osprey population back to the beaver ponds and stuff where there is an issue. There's ospreys are doing really good in a lot of places without any help. Um, one of the issues now with platforms is that because the, sp the species has recovered, it's not listed, they're doing really well, except in a few spots, um, that the agencies and stuff are not going to spend a lot of money on them anymore. I think that's kind of the gist. Um, if, again, my, from my standpoint, I think that's a species and others that we should keep watching in case they have a downturn from something other than like competition from eagles. You know, things like the fire treatment chemicals and stuff that are a concern now. You know, it, I don't know that that's leached out into the environment that much or what impact it might have, but we, we're still, all of us are, are hot in this room. We got chemicals in us that are, you know, 100 years ago people didn't have in them. And, you know, at some point is there going to be a, a, a new DDT or something out there that's going to impact some of these species. So. That was the crux of the fish-eating birds, whether it's eagles, loons, um, osprey and stuff. And so that was critical. The platforms played a really important part in re the recovery. But yes? Uh, what's the northern extreme of their range? Uh, I mean, are, are they way up in northern Canada and Alaska? And the reason I ask is the second half of the question uh, with climate change. Is, and if it gets warmer here and it's not hospitable, is there some place for them to go? Do we expect Wisconsin osprey to someday become Canadian osprey? Um, as far as I know, they go as far north as there are viable fish populations. So they're not going to be up there where there's permafrost and stuff, and, and you know they need fish. And they do better with fish populations that are in, in lakes versus rivers, but there are osprey that do really well on rivers too. Um, the other thing is that they do well on the uh, ocean coast, and they go fairly far north on either coast. Um, I believe, well, I know they're in Alaska. I don't know how far they go in Alaska, but basically they can go as far north as there's a fish, a viable fish population. So, and how global warming affects that, uh, I'm not sure. You know, it's, um, it'll change, uh, you know, we might have more warm water species which um, if they're more available than cold water species, you know, and they appear to be by our food studies, uh, that's what they use, then uh, it might not be an issue. Here 
I have a couple questions. Um, one, I've heard that an osprey will turn a fish with his head forward to be more aerodynamic. Um, why doesn't an eagle do that? Is it just the size? Well, I guess I would. I don't understand that an eagle doesn't do that. Um, the osprey, they have the most curved talons of any raptor, and then they've got rough pads on their toes and stuff for grabbing them slippery fish. And it might have something to do with they can turn two of their toes, well, well, they have one toe back, but they can turn a second toe back and have two forward and two back, like a woodpecker or something like that. Maybe that has something to do with it, but I'm not sure. Eagles don't turn them head first. I just <coughs> don't know that. But you definitely hear people talk about it. You see pictures. The ospreys definitely do it. Yeah. Second question. Thank you. Second question is, um, how does an osprey uh, miles per hour compare to like other raptors? I mean, like a like a falcon or um, obviously an eagle or, or or another faster bird. What what what's their mile per hour at fast speed? I have no idea, but they have long, narrow, pointed wings like a falcon. Um, they don't spend a lot of time flying fast unless they only unless they're doing it chasing an eagle or migrating. But I don't know that they're known for speed. I no idea. Any other questions? Oh, here we got a couple. Here we go. Are they are osprey affected by lead the way eagles are? If they ingested it, they would be. But um, eagles get it from roadkill and hunter, re you know. Uh, game animals that are shot and, and the entrails and stuff left that the eagles uh, scavenge. So um, e it's because of eagles scavenging. Now the other type of lead that gets shot at them, um, yeah, they're, you know, they're subject to that too, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but they don't, um, they, um, in osprey nests, not as much as eagle nests, but we will sometimes find a lead sinker or, you know, lead hook and stuff. And, and in theory, I suppose, you know, there could be some ingestion. Um, over the years, at least once a year, we would save a nestling by, not that it had ingested it, but the fishing line had wrapped around them in the nest. Mm. Um, and the same thing with eagles, that can happen. And I know eagle, I'd taken a hook out of the wing and, you know, a chick, you know, and a string had wrapped around it. So that type of activity, would, um, fishing activity does impact them a little bit but not necessarily from ingesting lead like the eagles do, you know, more so. Yes? The um, osprey nest at St. Germain in the ballpark yep. on the light fixture, they've evidently been successful, so I guess osprey don't mind being around people. Yeah, we talked about uh, before the meeting we at, lunch, or at, at dinner about... Um, like urbanization and the increasing number of people on the landscape. And ospreys are very adaptable. And they probably be, have been nesting on man-made st uh, structures on the East Coast, on the you know, Atlantic, for 400 years. I'm sure there's ch church steeples and lighthouses and stuff that have had osprey nests on them for hundreds <laughs> of years. So they are quite adaptable. One of the interesting things with some of the work I've done, and like on the Mead Wildlife and stuff, if you have an osprey nest that's in the boonies, and you go buy it, they get excited. If you have one at the ballpark, you can have a baseball game and they don't care. <laughs> you know? So it's, it's adaptability and what they're used to. Um, in Polk County, the Cedar, I think it's Cedar Lake Racetrack, has a nest you know, on the lights above a racetrack that every Saturday night in the summer they're racing. And, and they're successful. One of the things I think is it may keep predators away. You know, raccoons might not want to go to that racetrack because there's so many people and so much scent and stuff. So they actually might have an advantage. The disadvantage is there is a there were some pictures online somewhere where an osprey nest above a, one of the big banks of lights started a fire, <laughs> and that that didn't go so good. They actually had pictures of the whole thing going up in smoke or big flames. It was impressive, but not for the osprey. Questions? Does mercury affect them? Um, mercury would certainly affect osprey, and um, when uh, we had collected addled eggs, and addled eggs and egg that didn't hatch, for whatever reason, infertile or whatever, we had turned those in, saved them, and gave them to toxicologists and stuff, and I believe a few were checked, but I don't know all what they were checked for. Um, but unlike um, loons and eagles, there hasn't been a lot of 
testing that I know of, but mercury would uh, impact uh, osprey just like it would loons or, or eagles. And some of the stuff they found, and one of the things that um, a fellow had written me about, our because our, our birds were um, hatching young, but the young were dying, and they've shown in loons that a low-level, non-toxic, or um, non-fatal level of mercury would affect behavior such that these young loons didn't feed right and feed enough and mortality rates were higher. So there can be sublethal effects by certain things and I know mercury has been shown to be sublethal in some things. So our chicks that aren't uh, surviving really well, could mercury be an impact? And in Iron County Lakes, there's, um, we do have some advisories, mercury in fish um, and stuff, so they could be getting some. One of the things with this camera study is 100% uh, almost of the nests, they lay three eggs. Three chicks hatch. And all th we had one nest, not lay three, laid two. Every egg hatches except maybe one, so they, but they start out with three and they only fledge one. Mm -hmm. So that mortality is in the chick stage and it could be something like a sublethal toxicology or we think they just aren't getting enough to eat. You know, um, we did send... Uh, we did send actual chicks that had died and were fresh. Um, we, we found quite a few pancakes. And one of the things is if a chick dies, the parents don't remove it. So it just stays in the nest. And, these little, and then the, the little ones in the mind, you know, they're just all walking. It becomes a little pancake. And it's dehydrated. It doesn't smell too bad. But <laughs> our climbers would find those when they were, would be banding. And the toxicologists don't want them. They want a fresh chick. So when we did find a chick that had died very recently. We did send it in, and, um, and I found a bird that was, uh, or had reported to me, uh, a juvenile osprey that was flying from the UP, had been banded as a nestling, and it just dropped out of the sky. And uh, it was in an area where we were having a feud between a couple people, and the one guy said he was poisoning his pigeons, you know, and stuff. So we took it, and that thing had every test under the sun done to it, and it was nothing except it was skinny and and that's what the result was on every chick that we ever sent and maybe a sample size of seven or eight um, skinny but they couldn't find any uh, chemicals or any diseases or anything like that um, but there could be some sublethal sub lethal things happening that they weren't tested for mercury so can you uh, talk if you know about osprey calls especially when they're fishing no. <laughs> <laughs> Question online. How are ospreys banded and how do you catch them? Okay, good question. Um, in our study, we banded about 524 nestlings and about 12 adults. The nestlings, you get someone who's really brave to climb up there and grab the chicks put them in a bag, they rappel down to the ground <coughs> where I sit on the ground and band them. And um, they're a raptor, so they take, and, and the band is, you know, the osprey size, it's a size eight. It's a lock-on band, which means you put it on and then you crimp it over with vice grips so that they can't pull it apart with their talons or their beak, which is really strong. And so that's typical of the raptors, you put a lock-on band. And then we were putting those color bands on, which you open them up, put them on, and you use um, uh, super glue or you can use an acetate that, that melts the plastic together. And so those bands are put on if you're using a color band. That's how we do that. So the chicks are pretty easy. Um, we get them down and up as quick as we can because it does stress them a little. With the adults, uh, the first one that I banded, the climber was up there and um, a young gal, she was doing, she'd done a PhD on eagles and stuff and she was 50 feet high. And she goes, Bruce, the adult's on the nest. What do I do? Grab it. Well, fortunately, she got both talons with the first try because if she had only gotten one, the other one would have been in her hand. Um, and that wouldn't have been good. So we had two caught that way by the climber just grabbing them. The other ones, we put a dome that's the same diameter as the nest and it's so high and it's got fish nooses. And if you ever heard of a Bosher tree, that's a trap with nooses with mice in it or house sparrows and that's how you catch adult hawks and owls for banding. With this, we put this, what we did first is we took the eggs out, put them in an insulated container, and put fake eggs in. So during this process, they didn't get damaged. 
Um, and they shouldn't have, but we didn't want them to. And then you put the noose over, and so the female comes back to get at her chicks and tend the nest, and she's trying to get through this chicken wire dome that's got these nooses, and her feet get tangled. And then when she's tangled, the climber, and the climber has to come all the way down. We tried hiding them below the nest, and the adults wouldn't come back. They have to see the person climb down and leave. So then you got, but we leave a rope so it's safer. And then the climber has to go all the way back up, grab that adult, control it, put it in a canvas bag, and lower it. So the adults are really tricky. Um, I try, I've got a mechanical, oh, uh, mechanical bald eagle about this high made out of uh, turkey feathers and snow goose feathers with a white head, and, and he moves, and when I put a chick collar in there, then I've had females dive to protect the nest and get caught in a dugazo net that's just hanging there in space. So that's my mechanical eagle. Um, there's different ways. It's, this banding can be kind of fun. <laughs>